Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, this talk, as you can read from the uh, catchy title, is about how to migrate to React and how we are doing it in Edpuzzle. But hopefully you all will get something from it and can apply it in your companies. I'll try very hard to do that. And uh, in order for this to be really interactive and make sure that this applies to everyone, you f can feel free to interrupt me at any point, ask any question. We have a lot of time, and uh, I'm ready to answer anything you want, if I'm able to. So let's get started. Basically, I'll split the talk in uh, these four sections. Uh, we'll start with a short intro to Edpuzzle. The goal here is to understand exactly what our technical needs are, what our current stack is, what kind of application we are working with, because the migration to React depends really on what kind of app you're working with, right? all the requirements and that stuff. So it's good that I introduce the application, because you will understand more of the decisions we took later uh, with more context. Then I'll go through the step-by-step -step all the migration journey and, and the conclusions. And finally, we can end up with more questions, if you have any. So as a short introduction to Edpuzzle, we are an education media platform that was uh, founded four years ago by uh, three colleagues of mine and myself uh, in, in the USA. <laughs> we basically allow teachers to um, search for any video on the internet or upload their own, um, and then quickly edit it and make it a very useful lesson for the classroom. Basically, they can do stuff like cut the video, add questions in between that would pop up as the student watches, or their voice, things like that, just to make the video personal and uh, ready uh, for the specific students that teachers work in. <laughs> and in the end, when the teacher assigns it to their students, they can watch it in any platform, and the teacher will start to get insights of who needs help, who understands, who can move on, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, making video useful for education, uh, instead of just looking for the number of views on your YouTube video, which it doesn't tell you much about how your students are learning. This would be, for example, a very simple puzzle lesson. Uh, somebody took a thermodynamics video from YouTube, and they added four questions in the end. These questions are there, for example, to check for understanding, maybe trigger some thoughts, uh, start a debate in the classroom, whatever. The important part is that after the student watches this very short video, the teacher will know who watched it, who didn't, who got stuck in which areas of the video. Maybe that will help the teacher have a more informed decision about what to do next. And there are many education uh, apps now based on video, but I want to clearly differentiate what we're doing from, from the rest. You probably know as developers, platforms like Udacity, Coursera, Udemy, uh, even Khan Academy if you're learning maths and stuff like that. This, um, actually that's, uh, yeah, Th this platform is based on the, on the student. You can individually go to them and start learning by yourself. Uh, we follow a different uh, path. Basically, we believe that in order to reach the 23 students to 30 students in every classroom, you have to help the teacher. Otherwise, um, the teacher feels hopeless. And, and basically, teachers are a community that is very undervalued, and they need more technology to help them rather than replace them in the classroom, which other platforms who are more student-centered try to do. We believe firmly in, in supporting the teacher in this sense. And uh, after four years uh, working on this project, we uh, have now two offices. We started in, in San Francisco in an incubator there. Uh, but we have our technical office now in Barcelona. And uh, at the moment, um, more than 16 million uh, teachers and students have used our platform, uh, creating more than 5 million lessons. And that's approximately 50% of the schools in the USA. Uh, so the penetration has been great. And, and we're really, really proud of this. Um, and it keeps growing quite fast. So what are the technical specs of our application? It's basically a single page app with a lot of sub-applications inside, things like the video editor, the player with all the tracking in the background, uh, the progress reporting for each assignment, for a whole classroom, for an individual student, um, all the classroom management stuff, like who, which student joins which classroom, and stuff like that. But also a platform for the schools and even things like a grade book, which would be, for example, the more state-heavy view you would have in an app like this. So there's a lot of front-end state both read and write. It's not just like a reporting system. You have to modify a lot of state in the video editor, grade stuff, um, give feedback to the students. So there's a lot of uh, back and forth. Uh, and that this makes the application quite complicated. And at the moment, well, not anymore, but uh, it was fully written in Backbone and Marionette, which is what we started with four years ago. So once you have a little bit of context of the, of the technical aspects of the application, the kind of traffic we're getting, uh, and the kind of, of work that we have to do because of the traffic, um, you have a little bit more of an idea of, uh, with the small team that we have now, which is uh, slightly over 20 people, how can we handle all this and still migrate and make these technical changes on the go? So the journey. 
basically I'll start with why even React and uh, did we, for example, choose to use Redux or not? Um, it's important um, to set the goals here as well, like which is the things that we want to improve because of this decision. And then split it into strategical decisions, for business decisions more, more than anything, uh, which end up being constraints, be it in time, in resources, whatever. And then the technical decisions emanating from these strategic decisions. Finally, I'll dive a little bit deep into the implementation. I'll show a little bit of code. You don't have to really understand it, uh, but uh, basically the goal here is to show you how little code you need to actually do the, the, the integration be between two stacks. And finally, the edge cases, we all have them. These are the edge cases that take most of your time at work. So it's fair that I mention them because not everything is always ideal in a quick summary. So why even React in the first place? Basically, as I said, uh, we have a lot of state in our app, but most importantly, some of it changes over time without any interactions. In, the center part of it puzzle is a video, which advances through time. There's a lot of things we track for the video, where the student is, like, if the question should be open, even audio in the middle of the video should pop up. Um, and video is very unpredictable. Uh, as, as soon as a student enters with a mobile phone inside a tunnel, for example, the internet must be gone. So there are lots of little states where you can end up with, and you don't really know how. Uh, we get a lot of customer support in different cases. So development-wise, if you are programming in an imperative way, uh, you end up having lots of cases that you need to have in your head in order to make changes. So this is very unmanageable after a while. And background, uh, the people who already programmed with it know that it's a very imperative way of programming. And then why React? It's not just a technical decision. We have done trainings internally, and we have experimented, and the team likes it. I think the second part is the most important, but uh, it's also, like if your team doesn't like it, you shouldn't even start. Um, and for those who don't really understand what the concept of imperative and declarative code is, basically imperative would be the one on the left. You give orders in time, one after the other, uh, to reach, for example, from my, my commute from work to Idnik today. And on the right, you have basically just a screenshot of, of, the, of the journey itself. So on the left, to go from my work to Idnik, there are many ways I could have followed. Uh, so imperatively, maybe if there's a change in traffic, there will be many, many cases that you would have to account for. Uh, let's, Google does that for us, so we don't have to worry. But uh, you, you can agree that the right one is much more clear of which path I follow instead of just having to accumulate in your brain all the steps I had to, to follow to arrive here. And also, did we end up using Redux? I made it a goal of the talk for Redux not to be something you need to understand, to understand the migration. I hope I have accomplished that, but it's fair to say that we did end up using Redux, uh, mainly for the same reason I said before, Redux is a, just a different way to handle state in React, a way to extract it from the components, and because we have a lot of writes and reads, it was a, something that we were very interested in. So we have a lot of state across the wrap, and the way to, that Redux forces you to extract it uh, really saves us a lot of time. And also because uh, in our app, um, we have a lot of shared state between different sub-applications. Other applications, for example, banking, where each screen has its own state, you probably don't need Redux as much, because uh, that state doesn't need to live over time or stay in memory in any case. You just move around the app, and maybe the movements of the user are not so usual. They stay in a view for the longest time. So it, the benefits there are not so great. But for us, it really, it really was very important. And more than this as well, another reason was that our street is very complex. There's a lot of nested stuff, for example. An assignment has a video. The video has uh, an unknown amount of questions. Each question can have many answers. Uh, there's just a lot of, of state that is nested. And if you try to do in backbone, you're going to lose some hair. Uh, so, and we did. And then, uh, in the end, another benefit that Redux brings us is the testability of our mutations to that state. Not only that, but it also serves as a documentation of all the possible mutations that we have. So that it even helps onboarding new developers. And uh, before diving into the code and everything else, let's set the goals clear, because these are the goals that we're going to rely on whenever we have a, like a crossroad and we have to go one path or another one. First, uh, the business goal. I, I'm one of the founders of the puzzle, so this is some, something I, I pay a lot of attention to because we have a, we're a small team, so we have view of what's going to happen in the future, and business is, is very important to make the technical decisions. So first of all, we, we don't want to disturb the roadmap, um, basically because it's quite full already. We have a lot of, of teachers, a lot of stuff that we need to implement, but also legal requirements. We all know GDPR is coming in May, so that's also something stuck in your roadmap right now, and it cannot be moved. <laughs> And then the other business goal was, can, how can we improve the overall team communication uh, with this change? For example, uh, align the design team and the front-end team. And then, as a result, increase the quality of our product in the end, which is what we all want for our teachers and students. The technical goal was quite ambitious, 
which is how do you start using React and Redux as easily as if you were starting that from scratch um, while still having the legacy code right there and maintaining it all the time with zero impact to your teachers and students. So they should not even notice there's a technical change happening. But the developer experience that you have when you're setting a new React and Redux application is great, and that's one of the reasons why we all, when we see it for the first time, we say, this is much better than what I'm doing uh, at work, right? So how can we accomplish the same benefits without having to throw away everything we've done for four years? And finally, the design goal, which I mentioned in the business goal as well, which is how can we start using the same language between the design team and the front-end team, especially because as we started this migration, was when we were forming our design team from scratch, so it was a, a great moment to stop, talk, and align ourselves. And on top of all of this, uh, there was in the roadmap a scheduled redesign and rebranding of the whole company, so we should better align those things because they're both quite disrupting in terms of, of the time we need to invest. So technical decisions. Um, so, sorry, strategic decisions. Basically, there are two questions that we have to ask ourselves. Is, can we do a full rewrite? And we all know the answer is no, otherwise this talk would be quite boring. Um, but the reasons why it's not possible is, first, it would take months, probably I'm wrong, with this deadline already, it probably takes more than that. And um, also, the seasonality of the education system doesn't allow us to stop for such a long time. Basically, we have a lot of traffic during the semesters, uh, so from September to, to January, then there's a little break for Christmas, and then until June. And in the summer, we have uh, teachers using the platform, but no students at all. And then in September, we can double ourselves in a couple of weeks. So there's no easy way to fit the rewrite so that it doesn't f basically take the whole time where the teachers are at school and the students are at school, which would be a missed opportunity to improve the product, or for the rewrite to end right before maybe doubling ourselves. And if we have bugs, which every rewrite has, they're going to be very, very incremented, and we're going to have a very bad time. Also, in education, being buggy penalizes you uh, a lot. Because just imagine you're a teacher, and it's summer, a Friday afternoon, your students just had lunch and played uh, in the, in the in the yard, very like strong sports, sweating a lot, and then they come back from, from lunch to your classroom, they're really uh, nervous, and then you say, I'm going to do something cool, I'm going to use videos, so they are uh, engaged, and then the platform fails on you. Uh, it's a very, very tough situation to handle, especially if the teacher doesn't have a plan B. So we have to be very, very reliable, um, because even if we have a bug, we only have less than one hour to fix it, or we'll have ruined the one hour classroom of the teacher. So we are, have to have that in mind at all times. So rewrite mm, doesn't sound so good. And then, as I said before, there are some fixed things in the, in the roadmap. We cannot just put all the front end team, all the full stack developers on this, because we have a lot of stuff, GDPR is one, but other little changes in the US as well. So those things already require most of our team. So how can we do this with like one, two people progressively? It's something that we really need to think about. And the second question is, do you renovate or do you rebuild? Uh, you can as well like, start introducing React little by little, but actually have the same product overall. Or you can take this chance and align every team in the company, doing the redesign, the rebranding, the technical changes, and rebuild parts of your app completely. Um, we think it's a better opportunity if you align those, those teams, because the metric of success, if you are just making a technical change, is that the product behaves the same way as before. It's not really so exciting. And in the meantime, you will still get customer support requests, uh, bugs that you need to fix. So it's not a very good experience. If you have done it before, you probably know it. Um, so we believe that it's much better to rebuild, maybe subsections of that, but rebuild them from scratch, redesign them, align them with our new branding, than actually just making technical changes in the background, which uh, don't benefit the overall product or the overall company. So these are two constraints. We cannot rewrite, and we're going to remake uh, every part that we do in React. We're going to rethink it from scratch. So technical decisions. This is probably the part where all your team gets together and uh, starts idealizing about how cool it would be to have React and Redux already everywhere in your app, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. You don't see how long it's going to take. You wish uh, the world would stop and then you would be able to rewrite everything in your own time, uh, but this is not going to happen. So you need to scratch your head and start making, asking the, the hard questions. So the first one is where do we insert React in our current stack? Like, do we do like a single build? Do we, like, let, let's think about this. Then, if we plan to use three DAX, do we do it from the start, or do we wait until most of the state is out of backbone and do it in Redux already? That's a fair question. Um, and if we're doing this progressively, 
how do you handle those situations where you have state in the background part and React part that are actually the same? That uh, sounds like a challenge, so we will have to deal with that as well. And then routing, like every application, front end application that is a single page app needs routing, so um, do we add it from the start or do we still rely on Backbone Router and then later we do a project in the very end when Backbone doesn't, doesn't create any of our reviews and just redo the routing layer? That's another question. But before answering this, we need to analyze our architecture, where things are. Uh, just have everything in your head, because maybe you've been working for two months in a feature, and you kind of uh, forget about the rest. So we need to sit down and analyze the whole code base. And in a front-end app, you basically have these five blocks. Sometimes they're together, sometimes they're split, mm, whatever. But conceptually, you have the writing layer, uh, in a single page app, that is. Um, the business logic, whatever it is, like handling uh, user interactions, all the um, whatever, authorizations, um, all the different parts that your app has, like our mediator, stuff like that. The view layer, and then all the state that you accumulate, and the connection with the API. Sometimes, for example, in Backbone, state and API are together because you do it through models and collections, which not only store state, but they also communicate with the API. So in our case, that will be together. So let's find all of this. If we want to make it React, we have to find all of these layers in our app and know where they are. So that will help us answer the questions in the beginning. Where are we going to add React? So let's analyze it, because we're going to have to migrate it sooner or later. So it's better to not kill ourselves and then find the problems as they come, but do a, a good plan for the future. So where are these parts in our current architecture? This is a super, super simplified schema of how our application is organized. You have an entry point, and then about 25, 26 sub-applications. Uh, for example, the Classrooms app and the Video app. The Classrooms app will have, for example, the views for showing the classroom to create a new one, to edit it. Uh, the Videos app will have, like, for example, all your content that the teacher has accumulated. Uh, maybe the video editor as well, all this kind of stuff. So let's analyze it. I'm going to go, for example, take the Classroom app sub-application and analyze that one from the entry point and notes down. I'm going to show code. You don't really need to understand it. You just need to know, OK, in this note, the routing is here, there's state here, there's views here or not. Like all the layers that I said that a front-end application has, we need to identify in which node they live. So let's start with the entry point. Basically, what we do is very simple. You start a Marinette application, and then you just call start, and then, then there's a callback that gets called where you can start the sub apps that your app is composed with. And then you do something very important, which is start listening to the URL changes so that background can trigger different navigation as the URL changes. So in this layer, we basically have routing. It's a very core part of it. There are no routes, but there's this code knows about background history, so it does routing. If you go down one node, the classroom app, this one basically has one responsibility, which is define all the routes that the app sub app cares about, uh, connect them to a, we have a controller that has some methods, basically this show here, with the show right there. And then uh, this receives the parameters from the URL. You do, for example, some very, very basic authentication or authorization here. Um, and if that authorization clears, you can uh, basically go move down to the next node, which would be, for example, showing one classroom. All right? So let's go down to that node. But first, this layer, what does it do? It does routing, defines all the routes. It does business logic, very little one, but it's authorization, and that's business logic. And then there's state, because if you can see here, it accesses the session uh, where you store who's logged, who's logged in at the moment. So that's already knowing about the state. Let's go down to the show classroom uh, node. Um, and basically, it does two things. It has a controller that gets instantiated, instantiated and it does three things. Here I simplify it with two, but instantiate the model and trigger the API request. Then here you would add some listeners to the view so that the clicks, everything that you want to listen to, and instantiate the view, give it the model, and show it. And the view is very simple. It just has a template, right? Very easy to understand. You don't actually need to, to know background or Marinette to understand this. So this layer has a lot of business logic because it has all the user interactions. It has the view layer completely here, uh, state, because it's the state that uh, is holding the model. And then it has API requests, because in Backbone, uh, the models are the ones who connect. You don't have an API client, unless you architected it that way. Uh, if you start from the beginning, maybe you, you use models and collections thinking it's cool, and later you regret it when you actually realize that everything stayed together. So back to the initial question. Where do we insert React in this, uh, in this architecture, right? There are three options that, are, that we, we thought about. The first one, of course, everywhere. Uh, this would be the rewrite, uh, at least of that sub-application. And um, first, it requires redoing the whole routing layer, because as we saw, 
the routing layer is in those top two nodes, here listening to backbone, and here defining all the routes. So if you do this, you're gonna have to redo the routing layer for the 25, 26 of apps, even if you're trying to just migrate the cluster map. So it, it's kind of a lot of work, and the routing layer looks simple until you have to change it. Um, so you have to have the whole context of the flow of your app in your head to change it uh, properly. And then migrating the whole routing layer, it has another drawback that it's not so obvious. It's everywhere in your code where you're doing navigation, that has to change as well, because if you are using now React Router, for example, that navigation needs to be done in React Router. And we all know that imperative and declarative code, like, are you going to use the, the, the link, the redirect from React Router? What are you going to do? Like, it's going to be, uh, it doesn't look so, so nice. Um, and it's going to be a lot of work. You're going to have to touch almost every file of your application just to change the navigation. So option one, protect from the get-go. Option two. This is probably one that you will find a lot of videos about on the internet. Um, I will link to a talk later if you're interested. But that would be maybe starting from the lowest nodes of your tree and just adding React uh, on your, to, to change the view layer. So it's very simple. It wouldn't require adding React, uh, Redux or React Router at all. That link is to a talk of, for, from Brian Florence called, I think, React, Don't Rethink React, something like that. You've already watched it, where he goes to the typical to-do app, and he starts changing little components. Uh, it's actually from Backbone to React, so the ones who are trying to do that migration. It's kind of interesting. But as I said, one of the business goals uh, is to not rebuild, but to uh, not to renovate. We're rebuilding each model. We're redesigning it from scratch. So this option is not something we can do, because uh, this is perfect when you don't have buy-in from your CTO or, or the role might just to there's too much stuff and you do have to make a technological decision without disrupting anywhere else in the company. So for us, that we actually decided altogether that we're going to rebuild its application from scratch, uh, this doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a case that we don't have, but if you were in a case where nobody actually buys into React or Redux or stopping everything to, to migrate, maybe this is an option for you. And one of the benefits, as I said, is the deeper the node we migrate, the more likely uh, we'll have to still use Backbone as a state and then maybe pass it down as props. So this is something that um, breaks the technical goal that we were talking about, where we want to write the new code as if it was a new code base. This is the opposite. You're going to have to know backbone. You're going to have to know React. You're going to have to know where to put what. It's going to be a lot of context in your head, and that leads to bugs, guaranteed. So option two, for us, rejected. And option three um, basically means we're going to have two entry points to the React app and to the backbone app. And as we migrate from the backbone app to the React app, we're going to move the setups there. This sounds cool, but that requires a lot of, of little uh, <coughs> combinations there that we're going to talk about. First, it requires doing just the routing layer of that sub application. That sounds cool, because you can focus only in one, in one specific app, which is quite simple by itself. But to do that, you will have to find some way to make backbone history and React router talk to each other. And, that's probably going to take a while to understand how to do. You're going to have to understand very well how both work. And because we are migrating a, a node high in the component tree, like if you go back to the architecture, if you know React, you already know this. Sorry for the navigation. It, because we're basically making the cut right here. Uh, just as in React, the higher the component, the more likely it's a container component, the one that owns the state. The higher you migrate, the more likely you will not have to use backbone state. You'll have to make it from scratch uh, with React. So. And that goes with the technical goal of writing React, only knowing React without knowing the background. Option two. So, so you have the two different uh, uh, projects, right? Like two different uh, repositories. Yeah. Um, not, not repository, it's just folder structure. Well, I'll show that uh, to you. <coughs> so as I said, we'll have to m somehow synchronize uh, the routers. So. Um, we can migrate entire sub applications progressively. It sounds like a huge task, but each sub application is quite uh, reduced. We won't we will need to change other apps in the process. We don't have to change the routing layer or the way they navigate through the app. We won't have to touch that. So you won't have to relearn what you did or what somebody else did in order to make the changes without breaking anything. But somehow we have to sync both routers. And another benefit we can have from this is because we are migrating high in the component tree, we can start adding Redux and use Redux as a state container. Uh, you won't have to sync it. M most likely, you won't have to sync it with that one. We'll see the edge cases later. 
and you will have also React Router from the start, which is basically all the stack. Uh, it has the layers of a front-end application. It has routing, it has uh, business logic, it has views, it has the state, and the API request. You can also separate that progressively. So by, by itself, that app could leave. It does a, a less uh, full-feature application of our company, not very useful, but by itself, if you wanted, you could cut the backbone app, and it will leave by itself. So that's on school because everything we make there won't require us to think about the other app. So you can, it's like starting your own pet project again with no legacy code, nothing to worry about. So let's dig deep into the code, how we solve the synchronization between the routers. First, how do you keep both app, apps really, really separated so they don't know about each other? And for now, let's assume that each application is a full, like it covers the full screen. It's not like a sub app within a sub app, okay? Uh, later, we'll, we'll go into the edge case where this doesn't happen. But let's assume that application covers the full app. So the first thing you need to do is go from, for example, this. We had some regions that uh, Backbone or Marionette, in this case, uses as a, a container for different views that you can start inserting in them. We have header, main, footer, and a model region, just like most apps out there. So we change it from this to this, where we encapsulate the Backbone app there, and we create a new node completely separated in the HTML for React. Then, this already kind of gives you a hint that whenever the React page has to show, the backbone one has to hide somehow, right? So you can do this very imperatively, like every time I show, like order the other one to, to hide, or you can start using React and the declarative nature of it and create a component that you wrap the whole React application with, and every time this one is rendered, it hides the backbone one. And every time this one gets unmounted from the DOM, it hides the backbone one because we only have two frameworks. If we had three, then we'll have a, a problem, but this is not happening, right? So very simple, you just cover the, like, wrap the whole React app with this, and it will magically switch, and I can promise you, you can try later if you want, the user does not see any kind of uh, flicker at all. So basically, you end up with this kind of architecture. You have a new entry point for React that connects to the classroom app, and the rest of the legacy code is living somewhere else. And to add the React entry point, you basically just have a file with uh, defining the routes for React Router, in this case the classroom route, and that's it. You just end the application there. Backbone Hider is the component we created to hide the backbone part. You could actually put it above if you want to, to not repeat every route, and just for the sake of the example, you, you can see this. And we're connecting to the class uh, in the HTML that we uh, purposely created just for the React app. And the folder structure, like you were asking, we are not having two repos, repos here. We're just having, basically, we had an app folder. We create a new one, parallel, um, where we start make, putting everything. The entry point is the index.js file. And also, here is an opportunity to change the wording. Instead of calling it subapps, sub designer things about pages. So let's call it pages. It's going to be much more obvious when you talk to the designer uh, which page you're talking about. Because when you do subapps, classroom show, it sounds kind of like crud. Create, uh, read, update, and designers don't talk that way. Uh, so let's just change our wording as well. The benefit of this folder structure is that in the end, when you start moving things up, you will have to delete the app folder for Backbone, and the migration is done. Another thing that is quite important, how do you handle the CSS? Um, because a lot of the CSS has already been created. You can use the same philosophy here of separating both apps. We decided first to use CSS modules, not add any other uh, fancier CSS in JS implementation for one simple reason, not because they are bad, they are actually quite good, but to keep the barrier of entry low for the designers to take ownership of those shared components everywhere. If you start doing it in, in, in JavaScript, they have to start learning React from the get-go, and uh, they start using their time for something that they shouldn't be doing. They are the good designers because they are very good at design, so if they become front-end developers, that's another position. Uh, maybe they don't like it. Either. So as a rule, we explicitly never reuse the current CSS uh, rules. We just create also in the folder structure new CSS for the new application, which in the end, this is all looking long-term. When we have to finally kill the background app, we just kill the CSS from before, and that's it. And if you start worrying now, like how are you gonna man manage the bundle size, don't worry, there's a section for that as well. Um, so also remember that we're redesigning, so the CSS is not gonna be the same. It's gonna be, there's gonna be some common stuff that you are very, very tempted to reuse, but the rule is to not do it, and the new CSS looks quite different from the old one. And for the really interesting part, once we have both apps living in HTML differently, we have the two entry points, each of them instances in the router, how do they talk to each other? Because now there are two apps that um, they don't actually know about each other at all, so the user doesn't have the power to move between them. 
basically, this is the situation that you start with. You have the URL for the browser, and you have Backbone trying to modify it, and React Router trying to modify it. This is not cool. Uh, all of the races to change it, uh, you don't have an expected behavior. If you are, for example, a new developer that knows about the React app and the URL changes from somewhere magical in the background area, uh, it's going to be very confusing. So mm, we're not going to do this, but there's a better version. Thankfully, React Router is used in many platforms, not, not just the web, and even it's thought uh, in, in a way that it's very testable. So they have different routers. There's a browser one, which is the one that has access to the URL, but there's another one, which is the memory router. Basically, history is just, what is the history of, of a browser? It's an array where you push URLs and, and you move back and forth. It's, it's just that. It does a lot of things, but conceptually, it's just that. So making it live in memory, it's just like using a normal router. It just doesn't have the privileges to modify the URL, but it's a, an array of, of routes that you have to navigate. So the first thing, this is the, the way we're going to try to make it work, um, where Backbone is the ruler, is the one that has access to the URL, and it is responsible for Telling real router, okay, we move to this URL. Which was which one to win? Why backbone and not real router? Because most of the app is written in backbone. So if you make real router be the one dominating, you're gonna have to change a lot more code. So the to-do list to make this happen is make sure React Router does not itself modify the URL uh, bar from the browser. Sync um, both routers when the URL is changed, when somebody navigates, enters, whatever. Um, also sync it when there's a um, silent navigation, like whenever you change the URL without actually triggering, triggering a route change. And also when somebody navigates from the React code, React is going to have a navigation as well. So you don't want to have backbone code in the React code because that breaks the code that we said that you should write it just knowing React and React Router. If we start having imperative navigation of backbones in our React views, uh, we are kind of defeating the purpose. So we're going to have to find a way to do that. So let's go step by step. The first one, I said it before. This is, for example, the React app. I just erased some code for the sake of simplicity. But you instantiate uh, history is the package that React Router uses internally. Because we are also storing some of the URL state in read apps. We just split it. But if you didn't want to do that, just know that history is the package within React Router. Okay? And it has a, a method called uh, create browser history, which is the one that has the privileges to access the URL. So instead of doing this, you have to change it for the memory history one. Okay? Very simple change, just one line. So the first step, done. And now it doesn't have privileges to change. Second, how do you t tell Backbone to synchronize React Router? Basically, you need some kind of node. In our idealistic architecture from before, now we need some node in the middle that is responsible for making this communication from the right to the left. So let's look at this node. It's going to be like a sub -app entry point where the, there is a router. So it's something like this. Basically, you have a router. And uh, Marion has a, a method called onRoute that gets called every time uh, a router is hit in the backbone part. Um, so what you have to do is just uh, have a reference to the history that you're using in the memory uh, router from React and just push the path. That's it. Anytime any of the routes of any of the sub application is hit, this is going to get called. You push it to Redux. Uh, to, to um, React Router history, and then all the routes that are defined in the React part will also, it's going to look if there's any route matching that one as well. So if that's the case, if there's a route in React uh, defined there, means that you're already migrated. So in this case, when there's a match, you do literally nothing. You don't want to instantiate any background app, any background sub application, any view, anything. So you do nothing. This is define a method that does nothing. And this is going to cover most of the cases. Every time somebody writes directly to the URL, every time somebody navigates back and forth, because all of these actions trigger a change in the background router. So it's going to call the on route, and then it's going to push it to the memory history from React. But then there's another edge case, which is when you change the URL without triggering a routing event. When would that happen? It's the same diagram as before. But it happens, for example, imagine you are in the video editor, and you are creating a new video. In the beginning, you don't have the ID of the video, but you actually want to change the URL so that if the user refreshes, after the first save, they still remain in the same editor uh, as before. Otherwise, they may be lost uh, one hour of work. So you probably, every time there's a, the first API request to create the video, you suddenly change the URL, but you don't trigger a routing change. You don't want everything to re-render, especially in a video editor where you need everything to be living there. No renders, no uh, fetching HTML, anything like that. So this is an example. In this situation, the on route from the router is not going to get called. So how do I tell um, the history from React Router that something has changed? And basically, we were lucky here because we already had a class um, 
called navigation helpers with a method called navigate where you pass route and some options, whether it triggers a routing change or it replaces the previous route. For example, in the previous case, it would be like a silent replace. Um, so we had everything we wanted here centralized in one point. So what we had to do is whenever anyone navigates without triggering, if it's a replace, replace it from the memory history. And if it's not, just push it. So we covered the third case. And now the fourth one, which is how do I avoid using backbone history in my React code, imperative navigation with declarative views? And um, this is the last of the arrows that we didn't have to cover. And navigating, as I said, navigating with our class, our magical class that thankfully we, we created, uh, it feels like a failure to our initial purpose. So what we decided is how can we implement some custom components uh, called uh, Backbone Link or Redi Backbone Redirect that have exactly the same API as React Routers Link and React Routers Redirect, but internally they call navigation helpers. So that's exactly what we did. We went from this to this. We could have called it the same uh, so that as a developer you don't even know it's made with uh, um, navigation helpers, but uh, it's kind of maybe a lying to yourself. So we prefer to explicitly know that something's happening there so that in the end we do a replace everywhere and uh, explicitly make the changes. And it has exactly the same props as a React Router one. And you just have to use that in your views in React and it's going to work. And you have used the same structure you would have used in a new app and everything's working. And this is communicating with Backbone, which in turn tells uh, React Router's history to update. So it's kind of the full loop. And we have the four things uh, that we wanted to cover. Now the, both apps are completely connected to each other. Uh, in an ideal world where every step application is a full app, covers the full screen, this works magical. So one of the ways that probably some of you that I like performance are thinking about is how do you make this still performant in terms of network? And as I said, we work in school, so the network is not always the best. If you have 90 students streaming video from our platform, the rest of things are going to work slow. So this is quite important. And um, we did something that I think every one of you have, has done before. Um, I didn't mention it before. Uh, there's a prerequisite for everything I'm showing today, which is using uh, uh, common JS modules um, or imports uh, in your code base. We didn't have that four years ago. So we did a step that I didn't find interesting to talk about, which is to migrate to common JS uh, kind of importing files. But once you do that, you can leverage the power of Webpack. Um, but before that, we wanted to sit down and set some goals of what we want to accomplish because you can spend days and days actually tweaking the config and uh, earning like a little kilobyte here, a little kilobyte there. But we wanted to set some goals and, and be very pragmatic about it. So we agreed with some bundle size limits and uh, we learned backbone um, Webpack to the core, which is not that fun. And then we also added one step in our build process, which is uh, Webpack Bundle Analyzer, which <coughs> gives you a very clear view of, this is not our app, um, by the way, um, a very clear view of your component tree and <laughs> what things are covering a lot of space. You find things that, uh, like Moment.js, there is a lot of stuff. This kind of things is very clear when you have a, a UI that is opened every time you try to compile or you try to deploy. Um, so it's just thrown to the face of every developer in the company. So they are very aware of this and don't have to remember to go check it. So we added this and this already added a lot of the information we needed. So what we did is, um, First, we split every sub application into its own file. Um, we have two types of users, students and teachers. Um, actually, which sub apps get used more depends on the hour of the day. Teachers don't edit videos during class time, they do it after. And in, during class time, it's students mostly watching the video, not doing anything else. So you, you have a very clear case here where splitting the sub applications has a lot of benefit because they are used very independently, even if they share a lot of, a lot of state, especially the reporting part of the teachers. And we also created a vendor bundle in the beginning, like different frameworks and different vendors. But as we started migrating more to applications where it's very uh, hard to avoid loading both frameworks at the same time, then we joined that in one bundle. But you just have to use Webpack, Bundle Analyzer, and start playing around, playing around with the hashes, configure the, the CDN as well. And then actually we improved the performance from before where we didn't have Bundle Analyzer. And we we're kind of in the dark and just uh, measuring our performance with a network of our office, which is not the right way to go. So I would recommend increased visibility of bundle size to all developers not just one that knows uh, Webpack, but uh, maybe if they see a problem, they will learn Webpack because they want to solve it rather than actually having some task about learning Webpack, which is a pain. So a uh, recap. We can 
now with this structure, write React code that is completely unaware of Backbone, with the caveat that we're using Backbone Link and Backbone Redirect, which, as I said, you could have actually named Link and Redirect, and then there would be no caveat. But we just chose to make it very explicit that something magical was happening below. Backbone code can still call navigation helpers just as before. So if we have to make a change in the legacy code for whatever reason, we can still code the same way. Uh, some developers uh, learned React uh, later than others, so we, we like a team, part of the team went forward and started migrating the first app while the others were working on the old code. They didn't have to learn anything new. They didn't even know React was there. And then we just started moving and swapping the developers so that uh, uh, they worked in different apps, got a little bit more experience, and then we all now are quite confident with everything. And then React Router, the other uh, sum summary point that is very important, is only living in memory, uh, backbone history rules. It's very important. And why is this better? Um, there's a lot of talking about why is this better, uh, which is in the end what any developer asks in a meeting where somebody's proposing some weird idea. Uh, first, all the React application architecture is set up from day one. There is no uh, f uh, feared project in the end where everyone says, okay, but when we have to kill the backbone part, uh, we're going to find some mysterious uh, things that we didn't think about. For example, the routing layer. It looks simple, but it has a lot of authorization. If I migrated every sub application little by little, I didn't have to get the whole context in my head. And when we migrate, we just have to literally delete the app folder because uh, we're separating both applications, change, create memory history for create browser history, and replace backbone link for link and backbone redirect with redirect. And that's it. The migration is done, and we can all uh, sleep very well. And one side benefit from this is every time there's a new hire, uh, where new hires usually don't like Backbone or, or they worked on it years ago and they're not really excited about that technological part, they don't have to learn it from the get-go, uh, but more learn it when they need to, which is more pleasant, and start working on the React stack first. And then as they start understanding the flow of the whole product, you, you find problems you want to solve them and you start learning the Backbone part with actually a purpose, not really like a, as a chore. So it's really, really beneficial for that. To say, for example, because we have a junior program where um, we hire uh, students in the last year of university, where they do technical customer support half the time, and half of the time they do uh, learning how to develop. They just already have a, a base, right? But, and we slowly bring them into the code base so that when they graduate, they become full-time. And this is very helpful because they can start working on the newer code or making new stuff, redesigning new stuff, rather than actually having to solve bugs in our four-year-old full of edge cases code base that it's quite hard to, to grasp from the start. And you can actually damage their confidence even uh, when they don't know how to solve a bug and it's actually the fault of the senior developers who didn't do the right architecture, for example, myself uh, in the beginning. And I don't want to damage someone's career because of my decision. Right? And well, edge cases. Everything sounds very ideal now. You want to implement it in your company as well. There are edge cases. First, when a sub application is not a full page. We assumed this from the start, but in complex apps, this doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes you have, for example, I'm just showing an example. We have a great book that is within the classroom view. There are classes on the left, of course, all the navigation on the top, uh, stuff like that. And the great book app is really, really state heavy. We want to do it with Redux from the start, or we're going to have a project to redo the gradebook that we already redid. So how do you handle this situation? Because now, it has to, the, the, that sub application has to share the same HTML as Backbone and Marionette. So it cannot live there in the React app unless you do some magical z-index stuff that we're not going to do. Um, it doesn't sound fun. So we're going to have to insert it within the Backbone code. And uh, normally, this is a pain that we wanted to avoid, because in Backbone, you declare which uh, diffs are regions, and it does a lot of magic, adds a lot of functionality there. So if you mount a backbone, a marionette module, and put a React one, and then mount marionette again, maybe you forgot something in the process, and it starts having some weird bugs. So how did we handle this? Because we cannot long, no longer do this with a great book app. We need to do something like this, that magical new note. Remember here, again, the goals from the beginning. We want to write the new code, even this one, completely unaware of the backbone part using the whole stack, so Redux, and using React Router. Otherwise, we would still defeat the purpose. So how did we do that? This. Basically, you have to create, this is a snippet I, I took from the internet as well. Ours is very similar. You don't have to read line by line, but you create a, a React view in a Backbone that in the render, it just renders um, your React app. So it's kind of another entry point to your React app. And because we're using Redux, you also add the provider, the router, and everything. But basically, you have this kind of view that you can uh, start declaring different apps there. 
Um, so it's a second entry point. Now, we have the, the one that you cannot see from the Classroom application and then the new entry point from the Gradebook app. Let's check if we're comfortable with this solution first. We have two entry points. I don't know if that's good or bad, but what I know is that once we kill all the vacuum part, we're gonna have to join them. It looks easy. It looks just like moving the route on the first entry point. Um, so it's not a big deal. But the big benefit is that the Gradebook app still is completely unaware of Backbone, can use the Backbone link, Backbone uh, redirect, everything. So the Gradebook app will not need a second iteration once the migration is over. Thank God, because it's a very complicated one. It's not like a prof user profile, something like that. And then now we are having a situation where idealistically Redux contains some state, Backbone contains another one. They're not the same. But in real apps, uh, this doesn't happen, especially in our situation where we share state among views. How do we handle this? So how do you synchronize the state? Um, here, for example, there's experience Ilya did it in Red Booth. There, there's a package on GitHub where they synchronize collections and models with Redux. We saw the package and we were scared by it. <laughs> so we completely tried to go any other way before actually going to that, especially because I saw the last commit was kind of far in time. So maybe it's you are, working, so it's working. Yeah, it's working. Uh, I thought maybe you abandoned it for some reason that it's not mentioned in the readme. So it was kind of scary. So what happens in a situation where you have two uh, sub applications that share the same state and because of the roadmap um, or the technical decisions, you migrate one to React and Redux and the other one cannot be migrated because if you do it together, it would take too much time. How do you do that? It's basically this situation in this little diagram. For example, the editor app shares state, which is the video itself, with our video library. Uh, it's kind of common to navigate between the two. So this is happening. Which options do we have? Option one is just duplicate the state. Even the API request, the backbone part, does uh, the request by itself and the Redux part as well. So you duplicate the API request when necessary and keep both apps unaware. This is an easy solution, but in some cases, um, for example, the gradebook, that API request does a lot of stuff. Uh, so you don't want to be navigating and making the user wait all the time, or they're probably not going to use the gradebook at all. So for things that are simple, this is ideal, like fast API request, you can do it and leave properly, and, and then just schedule for that second sub app to be the next one to be migrated, uh, and maybe for like a month, you just have that duplication. But for heavy API request, uh, this option might lead to quite bad of a UX. So option two, this is the one that they did at Redbooth, which is you completely synchronize both. So you probably have to think of something low level like they did, where you can synchronize both technologies and it would work everywhere. Um, I, I just added the link, for example, to the repo if you wanna dig into the code. Um, so what are the pros and cons of this? When the shared the state changes in Redux, we have to propagate the change to the corresponding backbone model or collection, and vice versa. Um, but this breaks our technical goal, unless we completely find a solution or use uh, Redbooth one where it's completely isolated, like some kind of low level architecture layer that handles all of this. If you don't do it properly, um, you probably will have some code that knows about each other, uh, maybe in the React part, which is what we want to avoid. So if we can, let's reject this one. We can go back if, if actually it's the only option left. And the option three, which is, I have to say, it's a disclaimer. The Gradebook app is mostly read only, the state. You don't have to modify it. So the likelihood of the state in the Gradebook changing in the Gradebook on the side of Redux is low. And maybe if it happens, you can actually handle having unsynchronized state there. It's not really a big deal. So the option three is to just synchronize changes in, in uh, the state in backbone. In this example, the video editor was made in backbone, so a lot of changes, questions added, uh, stuff like that. But then the gradebook was kind of a reporting of that only, or the video library in this case, sorry. So what would that be? It would just be the second point. Whenever there's a state change in backbone, we trigger a specific Redux action, because that's the way you're mutating your state, maybe for that state. So some others might live in the components, but in this case, it was living in Redux. Um, so you just have to have a reference to the, to the store, Redux store, and use the dispatch method on it to, to launch one of the actions. You wouldn't actually hard code the action, but for the sake of the slide, this is what you would do. So in your backbone code, you will have some awareness of the Redux one, but the React code still lives happily by itself uh, without knowing anything, which is exactly what we want. So our decision was, we use option one, duplicating the API request whenever we can, which is 90% of the time. And we use option two only when the API requests are kind of uh, 
uh, heavy, like stuff that the user doesn't want to keep reloading or they're going to spend 10 minutes uh, seeing all the reports of the students and stuff like that. So we use this in the gradebook, but uh, at the moment, nowhere else. And if we can never use option three, or we'll have to, to make a call to this man right here and ask him to explain. True, by the way. Not true? Uh, React, I mean, Red Bull React, Dax was using exactly the last option when the source of truth was back on. And okay. Dax was just listening. Okay, then we agreed on that. So I would probably call you and you would tell me I'm doomed. And uh, <laughs> then we'll have to go back to option two. So as a summary of the edge cases. Uh, no, a summary of everything, actually. We have both apps completely separately. They can live on their own. If the background one was killed, the React one would live on their own, only with the sub-applications that it has migrated to, and the background app still lives on its own, and we call the React part. This is great. And we synchronize the two routers with a total of 19 lines of code. It's more complex about thinking how to solve it than actually implementing the solution. It's just 19 lines of code, and the only caveat is we're using these two components with different names, but as I said before, you could actually name it uh, as well, uh, the same way as React Router, and you won't have this caveat at all. So the conclusions is well, the goal was accomplished. Uh, we can work independently. Um, it's very easy to onboard new people, especially juniors. Um, and then we are very aligned with the design team. We don't have a constraint that doesn't allow us to redesign some parts or some legacy code that the design team needs to be aware of because it limits the way we can change our application. Um, we're creating a very, very good foundation for all the rebranding, all the style guides that we wanted to, to add. And with the CSS modules being so low level, the designers can take ownership. We have a separate folder where we start moving all the style guides. It basically limits the sketch file that our designers have. And they can actually go there and make small modifications. And, and it's really increased their productivity. And at the same time, we all sleep well because we don't fear that last project for the migration um, where we will not know exactly how to do the surgery. Uh, we know that the three steps are delete the app folder, change backbone link for link, backbone redirect for redirect, and create uh, a browser router instead of a memory router. So that takes five minutes, one developer who gets all the credit, but it's fine. So I already said this. So basically, that's it. Uh, I want to have some space for Q&A. And of course, uh, give the, the, the pitch talk here. We're hiring full stack developers. If you are excited about this architecture, we're still in the process of migrating. Um, we're here in Barcelona, and we're looking uh, for at least two full stack developers. We have Node in the back end, so full JavaScript if you're interested. You can talk to me after, or just go to the website and contact any of my teammates. Thank you.